So the simple list of people here, so the stuff I'm talking about will not be really inspired by a single word or even a small series of words. Yeah, so yeah. So the, the topics of the title say is a non topic, and in fact, I'll start talking about the algebra and atom, that's something that probably all of you are familiar with. But then the idea is that uh, similar ideas will apply in situations in physics where we don't know how to solve a problem, and the connection between semiclastics and large quantum numbers will then help us find a solution or face a public problem. So I cannot mention all the people who worked on so these are only two specific applications of these ideas. I cannot mention all the people who worked on this, but just the ones in the audience, maybe Sergei, now Shazad, collaborated with me in applying these ideas in the study of Mason, so they're spin. And the context of CFTs, this was applied. Well, among others, by Ricardo, Fiona, who is now in the audience, and you'll nice send later. And I think what did you see that? Okay, so let me get started with something you probably are all familiar with, which is the hydrogen atom. So the hydrogen atom, I'm a field theorist, I like Lagrangians so rather than Hamiltonian, and that's the Lagrangian for the hydrogen atom. So in the reduced coordinates, just one particle in a full potential. Okay, and uh, since later I'll use the Euclidean Lagrangian. If you go to complexified time, so you find, uh, or if you just you know, put an eye in the time, the Lagrange is the same with a minus in front of the Coulomb potential. So this is a system that you, we all learn how to solve in uh, our undergrad, and this is the solution for the energy level, the bound state. We are m alpha square over two n square, or in units of the Bohr radius, the Coulomb potential, units of the Coulomb radius, the units of the Coulomb radius, the Bohr radius divided by n square. The quantum numbers of these systems are n. So the quantum numbers you know are three quantum numbers, double the state, n, l, and m. m is the azimuthal with the jz projection of the angular momentum, the fall goes from minus l to l, l is the j square, so the angular momentum, and n is the rate of quantum number. And because of a uh, miraculous of all symmetry of this system, the energy depends on your length. So now let's look at the wave functions, as you all know. So if you plot the wave function, the probability density to find the hydrogen atom in some distribution of radius, for the ground state, you find something like this. You find a ball, roughly the probability density is localized around the ball, around the center. And in units of R0, the radius of this ball is roughly 1. So nothing uh, fancy. This is a strongly coupled state. You have to solve the full problem. You know. However, something interesting starts to happen if you start to look at a state with large angular momentum. So for instance, look at the ground state at angular momentum 9, you need to pick bar, of course. This is given by radial quantum number 10 for this equation. And you find that the wave function localizes around a certain radius up to a thickness that I'll describe in a moment. But it's roughly localized around the high radius here. So let me just, okay. I, I'm terrible at drawing, but that's my only drawing for today, so you're fine. So, and what's going on is that you find that the, that the, the probability distribution localized around the classical radius, which is uh, exactly the radius that you would get by solving the classical equation of motion for this angular momentum for the hydrogen atom. So now, if you look a bit closely, you would think, according to the slogan up there, that Fluctuations are small, but in fact, the units of these plots are not R0, but are 100 R0. So, fluctuation over the radial quantum number are actually rather large, but the point is that they are much smaller than the classical radius. So, what this plot shows is that the quantum fluctuation over the position go roughly like 1 over L. So, this is a well known story. And it's telling us that uh, states with large angular momentum are becoming semi classical. So, interrupting this question at the moment, of course. Oh, sorry, from your picture, it looks like L goes like whatever R. Oh, right. So, so the transformation is okay. R. I was. <laughs> yeah, so my picture is. Uh, yeah. is that, yeah, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> and it's sort of a sphere. Uh, yeah, it should be. Yeah, I'm mean, not just talking to you. Okay. Well, I mean, also it's localized also on the theta angle. 
What I want to show you now, something that you might know, but I think it's instructive, is how you can use this fact to actually compute this result rather than by solving the push schrodinger equation by, with, you know, like air polynomials, blah, 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 but by doing a semi-classical calculation in a power, in powers of 1 over n. And of course, the reason why I want to do that is not because, you know, I already know the result, but it's because this procedure will then realize more complicated cases. So what's the idea of the calculation? So the idea of one way to set up this calculation is to use that integral and consider the expectation value of the Euclidean evolution operator between a state with fixed values for with you know, the state could be whatever you want as long as you choose the projection of the JZ contour number to be m and m much larger than 1. Okay? And for concreteness here, I'm choosing the state to be specified by fixed positions in R and theta in terms of the spherical problem. So what happens, of course, is that in the large time limit, this expectation value, from now on, I denote this state i, in this state f, in the large time limit, this will project to the ground state at fixed gz. So they do not say zero n. And I will extract the energy from the power there. So, then the idea is to write this calculation, but the integral, as I said, the only thing you need to recall to do that is that the wave function for, in terms of the uh, phi angle for a fixed JZ state is just 1 over square root of 2 phi equal to i and phi. This is the standard wave function. If I do that, So the first factors here come because I insert phi in between there, and then I get the width function of the initial and final state. So I get it to be a m, phi f minus phi i, up to the sign. And then the rest is the fat integral with fixed boundary conditions. So that's enough. That's that. That's Into the minus the yeah. yeah. Okay. So the basic idea is that in the moment this m is large enough, this m has sort of partial and we write it more explicitly integral from 0 to t of the Euclidean Lagrange. So this m acts as a boundary term to this option, so it's going to fix the boundary condition in this top integral. So when I do the variation principle, I will find that this term here contributes to boundary condition in the equations of motion. And the idea is that if m is large, then I can do this by integral semi class. So I impose that time is equal to zero. And these are the equation of motion I find. Boundary conditions on R and theta, in particular on phi, I find this boundary condition. Let me say for this equation. Okay, so this is the standard equation of motion. This is a boundary condition. 
And what this boundary condition is telling you is just that Gz should be equal to m at the initial and final time. This is just written in spherical coordinate. There is an i because I'm working in Euclidean time, so that's why there is an i. But if you write it in standard time, it is. And the solution to these equations is again, you could have, even if you have not followed this, you can just look at this picture. It's just the particle rotating. So it's going to be r equals some constant of zero, that I'm going to write in a moment. Phi is minus mu tau, or mu is uh, okay. So when I say that the solution of this equation is this, I should qualify. I haven't taken into account the boundary condition on theta now. So what I'm saying is that whatever boundary condition you put there, as long as you wait enough time, the solution will converge. To this one here. So up to small triggers that will happen close to t equal 0 and t equal 2. Otherwise, you can choose the boundary condition. Again, this, is, this solution is nothing but the particle rotating on an orbit of radius of 0. And so, you say semi classical, but isn't this just classical? Or well, semi -classical? At this stage, it's at this stage is completely classical. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah? Isn't isn't this just uh, like this is what Bohr and Sommerfeld did, did essentially? Like they did. Yeah, no, no, I'm doing something from the thirties. Yeah, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they didn't present it in this way. No, no, no. But it's, it's, not, it's but... A, yeah, of course. I'm just, uh, yeah, but like, yeah, I'm not doing anything new. Right? Okay. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I I think I got a little bit lost. What's the problem we're solving? So I want to compute, sorry, I should say, I want to compute the energy of a stateless angular momentum L, where okay. L is large, but rather than solving the Schrodinger equation to brute force, I want to do it by expanding around the classical project. Okay. So I want to show you how to compute. So this, maybe what I should say already what the answer is here. So E0M zero zero is obtained in setting N equal L plus 1 equal L plus 1. So it's minus half over 4 naught square n plus 1 square. And what we are going to find are the first two terms. Because I'm just expanding. Okay, so this is, uh, again, this is like, this is the same as this linear Bohr sum, by the way, just completely classical. You're going to find the Bohr sum, just comes in the moment to declare that this guy is spontaneous. And then you find your value of the integral, you find that e to the minus classical action, this is equal to the minus and not but one square t. So you find that the fleeting orbit is zero of n. Is equal to minus m alpha to one square. So it's okay. If you remember the definition of the Bohr radius is the right result. So how to compute? So this is not exactly right, but there should be an m plus one. So there's going to be corruption. Here is where semi classical will become because this correction will arise by compounding the equation on top of this particular. So. Just to make sure, from this approach, you don't know m is quantized, right? Uh, well, you, you can. You, well, you can do more sum, but as it was said before. So, in very fancy language, uh, m is quantized because phi is two pi periodic. The, the m is the momentum of phi, and phi is a two pi periodic variable. But yes, it's essentially at, at this level. If you want to have a proof that m is quantized, and I'm not going to prove it. Doesn't that integral tell you that if m is not quantized? Yeah, I mean, it's when I write that with function, it's already implicit, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it, I wasn't going to. But if m was not integer, you'd have an anomaly, right? And that integral would be zero. Uh, yeah, I mean. Integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
Yeah, I mean, if I were not quantized, I think I wouldn't be able to do this procedure. Yeah. Or at least it would be more subtle. <coughs> also, I mean, I should say, I mean, okay, so one thing that I want you to appreciate is that even though we are in quantum mechanics, by doing the calculation this way, I'm using a classical trajectory. This classical, this system has some symmetries, in particular, tangent special invariance and rotational invariance on the other genomes. But well, this classical trajectory is purely spontaneously taking that. So particle is localized at some radius and it's orbiting. Of course, this is, doesn't mean that there is quantum spontaneous symmetry breaking in quantum mechanics. Essentially, it's because I have to average over this wave function at the end. So there will be no spontaneous symmetry breaking at the end. But there is an effective spontaneous symmetry breaking when I do the calculation this way. And this will be, at this stage, is a technical comment, but it will be used for later. So, okay, this is not exactly the right result. So I don't how do I compute the dot dot dots. I just have to expand. I mean, does this work? There's right. one in between, yeah. hiding between the front and the back. Yeah, reach your more. hand up. <laughs> just reach your hand up. Yeah, but then I I make this. It's okay. Uh, I I can. Yeah. I mean, I'll show. <clears throat> so this is the Lagrangian. Yeah. So this. And you have something very simple. Okay. Okay. So you expand your Lagrangian in quadratic fluctuation, and then you have to compute. So, what are these quadratic fluctuations? So the fluctuation of R, I expanded around this, fluctuation of theta, expanded around this, and fluctuation of pi here. Yeah? It seems odd that it's M and not L that enters. Yeah, so I'm using, a, I'm, I'm calling it M because I want to look at JZ equal J. So the M, I could, I could call it that. Yeah, not even call it M that. equals L here. M equals L here. Right. If we, in particular, all of the all of the energy levels for a given L will have this energy. Okay. Yeah, this follows. I just, uh, yeah, so sure in, in this way I'm doing the calculation. Since again, this, uh, so this other point is localized in a projector which has GZ equal M equal L. <coughs> so in this sense, in this way to do the calculation, you wouldn't manifestly see this fact. But by studying this fluctuation action more carefully, you could see that. I'm not going to comment about it. But it's yeah, right. In this way of doing the calculation, you don't manifest the C or the symmetry. You know, it's spontaneously local. But if M is not equal to L, it isn't quite so simple, right? Because you don't have exactly this um, yeah. classical trajectory. Right? Let, 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 me, let me explain that. Let me okay. comment that term now. Okay? Right. So this quadratic action, what does it describe? After the fact that they have plus time in mind, because I'm most Euclidean, it's Two harmonic oscillators and uh, with frequency mu, and a harmonic oscillator with frequency zero. You can get convinced. So I have omega r equal omega theta equal mu, and omega phi equal zero. It's not completely obvious to give you the definition, but it's good. So this means that I can create particles with energy mu on top of the states, or particles with energy zero. And this part will correspond precisely to the state that you're asking me. You have to recall that mu is given by this and by that in, ex in expansion. So these particles would person create other states in the S supreme multiplet, or would create other states with different m but same m. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they're the elliptical trajectories in classical physics. Well, yeah, in this way you've seen a small fluctuation over a very simple trajectory. Not only that, now I can tell you what is my quantum correction to that phase zero. This is a system of three harmonic oscillator, so my correction is just the vacuum energy. So omega r plus omega theta plus omega phi divided by two. And if you add this here, you find that this is precisely, uh, yeah, I think it's like this. The extra term you need here to complete the m plus one. Again, you will have higher correction, which are two loops in this language, right? It's not from the cubic and quartic vertices that I'm not writing. But you see that you can reconstruct semi classically the right result.
So is this hydrogen atom clear? So it, in, the, in this language, you lose the accidental degeneracy, right? Mm -hmm. All the you, you don't see it, well, you don't see it manifestly. Mm -hmm. But the fact that these two states have the same frequency mu, mm -hmm. it's actually secretly related to, the, you know, to that uh, accidental degeneracy. One of them had to be frequency mu because of the SO3. The other one didn't have to. This, maybe you're probably familiar with this uh, thing called Gat Gotson. There's a reason why this is related to that. But it's true that it's not, it's not linearly realized. But already in the hydrogen atom, it's not very much. <coughs> so, of course, for the hydrogen atom, as you said, there are many. That's not the right way to proceed. I mean, once we know how to do the Schrodinger equation. But it's still like, uh, I think, a lightning which we can do it this way. So, what is the message that I want to convey here? Okay, the first is in the title large quantum numbers in their semi classes. This means I can compute things in one over the quantum number. But not only that, large quantum numbers entail uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking on one side and scale separation. So the fact that there is one over L expansion here means that the ratio of the scale over the quantum fluctuation over the scale of the classical trajectory is suppressed by this quantum number. These are two concepts which are often very useful in field theory. And that's why I want to emphasize them in this example. Okay. By the way, this is very strongly inspired from the paper by Fiona and Ricardo. It's just that they studied a slightly different model, but uh, Ricardo presented this in many, several, some other places. So this is again, also this example here is not, not at all original. One. So let's start, let's do something. So now we're going to study a problem for which we don't have an exact solution. The setup will be the 3D O2 model. So roughly speaking, you can think of this as the critical point of the lambda phi four theory with a U1 symmetry in four dimension. In three dimension, sorry. So again, so this theory has a transition point from a spontaneous broken phase to a uh, phase with uh, the gap phase at the moment in which the mass is zero, roughly speaking. So at that moment, the theory becomes strongly coupled because this coupling lambda is very relevant in 3D. It's very large if you want. And uh, this Lagrangian, roughly speaking, flows to a strongly coupled fixed point, which is the two conformal field theory. This is the same. Uh, this is the theory that describes the critical exponents of the easy plane pair of magnets or uh, of helium 4 superfluid phase transition, among others. You might have seen this associated also to the critical point of this statistical mechanics Lagrangian. So it's a coupling between nearest neighbor spin with a J tuned to a fixed point. It's a lot clearer in the description. So what are the observables in this theory? The observables in this theory are critical exponents. So roughly, critical exponents are scaling dimensions. <coughs> so the idea is that you take two, in order to measure in state and scattering in particle physics, we measure two point functions of operators. And what we care about are these numbers here, two delta, these numbers here, delta. So they are fixed by the symmetry, these two point functions, there is no scale in the theory. And we want to know this delta. Again, if you are in field theory language, this also you can think of them as functional. So, these numbers here, if you look at them, they've been computed, some of them by Monte Carlo, but they're not pretty random. Like, uh, 
pi, the analog of pi dimension 0 0.5 by 2, uh, pi squared, neutral at dimension 1.4 or something. So it's it's a bit of a mess, this theory. So if you look at it, it's uh, it kind of doesn't seem like you have any useful weekly double description. But the point is that one emerges at large quantum numbers. So today I'm going to be interested, I'm going to call operators. Uh, Uh, with smallest delta <coughs> so I'm going to be interested in the operator with smallest scaling dimensions so or smallest parameters here a fixed values of the angular momentum the angular momentum is roughly the number of derivatives and charge this still is a human charge so there is, I can have these two quantum numbers Roughly speaking, these are operators of the form pi to some power, many derivatives, pi to another power. And these two powers add up to q. So let me just, just to have an example, it's not really this. This could be an example of an operator. The fact that they have the smallest delta means that if are only phi and not phi star? Or so, exactly. So, I'm looking at, uh, that's why, roughly speaking, that's why I'm only getting phi not phi star. I'm looking at the smallest delta because this is analogous of this figure. Look at the smallest energy state there. Here, this will be the smallest spin dimension. And this presupposes that the classical counting still works. So yeah, this is a schematic thing. I will not use this form explicitly anywhere. So, it's very schematic and it's very scheme dependent also. But this definition of the operator is good at the number two particular. But uh, I mean, meaning the operator with lowest dimension fixed quantum number, that's a well defined concept. The fact that it's written in terms of phi and derivatives, it's my construct. I can make sense of it in the absolute expansion, but it's not number two particular. Or not that I know of. And the question here, of course, would be what's this scaling dimension? They are called delta qj. Okay, so the reason why this is an interesting question is because, as I said, these kind of numbers are a bit random. However, if we manage to gain analytic control over them in some regime, we might be able to organize them in some useful way. It's a bit like the mass spectrum you did I'll discuss later. The fact that we see rigid trajectories helps us understand how to look at this spectrum even a small j. And plus, these numbers at large q and j are also measurable on their own. So they are interesting. Okay. okay so let me just take another one. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready. I think maybe I should go with that. Right? <laughs> yeah. comes from a property of CFTs. So, okay, I want to compute the two-point function, as I told you. But the two-point function, for some reasons that I will not explain, is the same thing as, so the two-point function computed in flat space is the same thing as the expectation value of the energy operator computed on the cylinder within a certain state. So the magic here is that to every operator in first space that corresponds a state for the theory quantized on the sphere with the same quantum number. And the energy of the state is just a scaling demand. That T over R, where R is the radius of the sphere. If you're not familiar with this, I'd ask you to believe me. I could have started this by saying that I wanted to compute the energy of some state on the sphere, but the observables that we measure are the scaling dimensions. So it's more natural to start from first space, but if you don't like that, I just want to compute the energy of a state on the sphere. So, the well, well, I mean, there's the special slides. The, yeah, I want to show you. The, 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 the special slices of the sphere. That's what I mean. 
But okay, this is. But okay, once you have this, uh, you have organized the calculation like this. This is the same calculation I did before. It's an expectation value between a winch operator between a set with large quantum number. Now I don't have the action for this theory in general. So let's look at J equals zero first. This would be roughly speaking some path integral for some fields and some classical action and some action. Now I don't know what this path integral means, I don't know what this action is. Or I know it but it's too strongly coupled for me to make sense of it. I cannot do Feynman diagrams. Lambda there is large, so Feynman diagrams will not work. But however, I can assume that this patinter is dominated by a classical trajectory. That's our intuition, based on the formula example. So, there will be some classical trajectory. What, are the, what properties should this classical trajectory have on general ground? But well, you should describe a state with charge Q. So you should have charge density. Charge density. Q over or pi r spin. So you should describe a state with this charge density. Now, when q is large, this charge density <coughs> is much larger than 1 over the volume, obviously. So there is scale separation between the state, the scale induced by the state, where you want the scale that dominates this classical trajectory, and the natural scale of the theory, which in this case is the radius of the sphere. It's like the hydrogen atom before. There is scale separation between the Bohr radius and the classical radius. Same thing. And uh, the other thing, and this already suggests if you have a field theory, there's a scale much larger than the other, there should be some effective field theory description. So you should be able to integrate out everything which is gap at this scale and be left over drawing the degrees of freedom that live at this scale. The other thing is that this trajectory should nonlinearly realize realization. Of the conformal symmetry times the O2 symmetry. So this system was invariant under a large symmetry loop, in particular, was invariant under scale symmetries and the two internal symmetries. This classical trajectory should break this symmetry. In fact, the fact that there is a scalar that requires an expectation value already suggests that the O2 symmetry will be broken. When you have a spontaneous breaking of an internal symmetry, we will have Gaussian losses. So is, is this very conceptual argument here? It's very conceptual. Yeah, but the formula that you wrote this equivalence it holds for large t, right? Yeah, large t. <coughs> so, the, so for t going to infinity, then it's uh, t much larger than the radius. Yes. Okay. Because then there are corrections. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on which state you use, yes. Can I add something? So, yeah. so intuition we started saying that I want a semi-classical state, which has big L, it means that the energy is pretty much close to the continuum side, and that's very classical. Yeah. But if you have a very small scaling dimension, why does it map to a large angular momentum that is the classical so, uh, definition I, uh, we have? So here the quantum number is Q, first of all. I'm looking at the charge J equals zero for a moment. We can all generalize to large J in 30 seconds. And here the intuition is the same. Q is numbers, if you want physically, what is the state? Well, Q is pi to the Q, which is roughly a state with Q particles. So we have many particles, you should expect semi classics. That's another kind of intuition that we have. So this is a state with many particles, and if Q is large enough, I should be able to approximate it by some classical state. Just a little Okay. Now, these are very conceptual arguments, but the idea is that. Once you have a certain point, there will be a scalar separation, there will be a simple effective field theory description. I will not derive this effective field theory description in general. It can be done in some examples. But it was argued by Ricard and other that the simplest possibility is whether you want spontaneously broken. Which means you have an effective field theory for one Gaussian Boson. And all the other states instead will be much heavier, and I will not describe them. 
So the fact if you theory, I'll just write them for the since there are some experts in the audience, but you don't have to look at this. A living order looks something like this. So it's written in terms of a non-analytic power. You might be confused, but actually, if you expand this action, it's actually very simple. It's not Lorentz invariant, you see I've got mu plus pi dot because I'm breaking spontaneously Lorentz invariants. But it's actually very simple if you expand it. Describe just propagation of sound with speed, sound speed one half, which is the right speed of propagation of sound in a component. If you want another way to argue for this effective field theory is that I'm describing a state with finite density at zero temperature. State with finite density at zero temperature in nature most likely come in two possibilities, either Fermi liquids or superfluids. Superfluids are theory where the human symmetry is spontaneously broken. This is the Lagrangian for superfluid. And the relation between pi and phi is... Uh... Well, after, yeah, it's like pi and Lagrangian. We don't know the, the, the relation. I mean, of course, you want to say it's the phase of phi, but uh, we don't know it, right? It's like Pai Lagrangian. We can only assume that the effective field theory exists and, and make sense of it. Okay, but the bottom line is that at the end, within this assumption, I can compute the scaling dimension. This has to be done by the <coughs> And you find this result. So these two coefficients are Wilson coefficient of EFT. I cannot fix them. But remarkably, this has been verified by Monte Carlo by now, and we know that this is like the numbers that this with some coefficient correspond to. Something like this. But this is uh, okay. So I saw within a one, with one assumption, I was able to solve the problem. And uh, you can now go, go generalize this. Sorry, I guess uh, I think I, I probably went too, too fast. So that, how do you get delta from that? Is the energy? Delta is the energy. Yeah, so uh, the step from here to here I'm speaking is the delta is the energy of the state of the cylinder. So, oh yeah, you can, I think the right way to say it in this language, you can compute the path integral with this action, the value the classical action, you have to write, be careful about bottom terms, blah, 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 and you get the result. But the C, uh, how is it? Because it's So C1 energy, is some function of this C, yeah. here. C2 is a function of, Coefficients by the terms. And you cannot fix C with this. No, you, you, you cannot. Not. So in Pan-Lagrangian, that's the FPI, so the, you will get it is exactly the analogous of the FPI in pi lagrangian or your plan constant in gravity. You have to measure it. So this, when I say these numbers are known, it means that they've been measured numerically by Monte Carlo. Of the original theory, you want to do the question. Yeah, for... people did Monte Carlo in the theory that you recited class. And, You can also generalize this to arbitrary Q and J. So, uh, but C1 and C2 are known functions of C. So can you yeah, they are known functions of C. Known in the effective theory. Yes. So you can compute it as functions Yeah, but of C. They, there are more coefficients. I just wrote the first mm -hmm. term for you. There are more coefficients, like pi and There are four derivative interruptions, and those determine C2. Six derivative interruptions, those determine other, other terms that you can write. So my, my question was whether C1 and C2 were functions only no, of little c. No, only C1 is functional in little c. C2 is function of something else as well. But they are really independent in the effective field theory. Okay, <clears throat> so even if you didn't follow any of this, like the picture which emerges is that living in a strongly coupled theory such as the two model, you have regimes, where the theory is weakly coupled. So, so that this is, and okay. So if you wanna have a schematic plot of what we understand about the O2 model, you might say that a small quantum number, we understand little, or we understand only from numerics. We understand, but only from numerics. But now at large quantum numbers, we have some understanding. In the large charge regime, I told you that the petit is a description in terms of a superfluid. Large spin regime is a description in terms of three particles. 
this I didn't, I'm not proving, I'm just taking as a result. And the intermediate regime, there is a description in terms of superfluid plus vortices. So the details of this plot are not too important, just to say that if you extend the idea of semi-clastics to arbitrary states with Q and J, there is a natural description which emerges that falls everywhere at large Q and large J. And when you extrapolate this description to a regime of small Q and small J, you see that operators nicely organize this result that you get from numerics, nicely organize the trajectory that extrapolate here. So this helps us a lot understanding the spectrum of the model. So this uh, large charge expansion is presumably asymptotic? Yes. So does this picture help you to understand number of curve corrections? Um, knowing that family of saddles in this... Uh, you know, there are infinitely in many perturbative corrections already, so I don't think it does. Not in this. In supersymmetric theories, perhaps it could, but not in this case. Uh, have people tried to analyze? I guess in the, when you draw this picture, you have already analyzed some kind of other saddles, right? Well, I mean, uh, I don't think it's really about other... Well, yeah, okay. The other saddles generally will... Uh, the last time in the saddle will give you enough for perturbative expansions. Yeah, I don't... But those other saddles typically involve uh, some outside and heavy degrees of freedom, so they're very, very model dependent. It depends on how you model them. I, I don't think we have a useful way to characterize those at this stage. Um, again, in supersymmetric theories, you can have some all the perturbative corrections, and then you can make sense of this question. But, okay. Okay, so this was a long time. 15 minutes. Okay. This was my really ambitious view of this. Okay. The last application will just be in pictures, so you don't have to, this will be now easy. So the, the idea of the last application is to use an old idea by Polikov that QCD in the number, large number of color limits is essentially a string theory. This is nothing fancy, just what you see on the lattice. You put a quark, an anti-quark, and then you see that there is a flux tube stretching between the two quarks. And this flux tube, your props, if you put the quark far sufficiently far away, <coughs> such that L is much larger than the Thickness of the flux tube looks like a string. So it's just a bit more fundamental than that, but but in God, this is what, what happens. So it's just to say that there's a linear potential between the Now, uh, so why people thought that QCD could actually be a string theory? Well, okay, they said, okay, according to this picture, what is a meson? A meson is some string stretching between a quark and an antiquark. And if the meson must spin, the string will be rotating. So this is a meson with spin j. Now, uh, okay, so you say all I have to do is to study strings with some endpoints. It's here said and done. I mean, as we know that. Okay, you can quantize number to auction with a stachyons. People have been working since here for 50 years. It's a quantum mechanical problem. But again, the first thing people did is again to notice that in the limit in which j is much larger than 1, this problem simplifies. Why is that? This problem simplifies because if you study the kinematic of a string, of a relativistic number of to string, for instance, you find that the length of this object goes like 1 over the angular velocity. And the angular momentum is that goes like 1 over the angular velocity squared. For a less, it's essentially the tension of the string that you can think in this theory swept up with the scale of lambda of confinement. So this means that the length of the string is square root of j times a less, which is much larger than the confinement scale when j is much larger than 1. <coughs> so 
What does this mean? Again, it's the situation as before. You have large quantum numbers, and therefore you have a scale separation between the confinement scale and the emergence of a classical scale. This means that you can, in this regime, the string is quickly coupled, and you can take it classical. So, j much larger than 1, string is classical. <coughs> And this leads to the famous prediction that, again, if you study a classical string, the mass is proportional to the angular momentum. And again, this is, of course, well known. If you plot, for instance, the rho a spectrum in real world, you find that this is the rho, j equal 1, 2, Three, four. Already at relatively small j, you find that particles lie on approximately linear trajectory. Okay, so people realized that string were classical when j was large, then looked at the data, so linear energy trajectory, said QCD is a string. That was the, I think, to, for, to a fair, unfair summary why people thought of string theory in the first place. Of course, then this idea was part of the development. Okay. So, okay, so this will be just a teaser because I think I'm a bit of a time, but now we understand that this picture really only makes sense in the idea of a petty field theory. So, pretty much like in the left charge case before, there will be corrections here in one over j. The question is how to compute these corrections or how to compute energies of state that correspond to small wiggles on top of the string. So excited dot the energy trajectories, which would be your finest for instance here. This would be some excitation on top of the string. And that's what we are doing with Sergei Sharzad, Guzman, and Sasha. And uh, so what is the time to do something? What I want to say at this time. So the, the subtlety is that a petty field theory breaks down near the parts. So the point is that the, in the real world parts are very light, or you can even take the mass test of simplicity. So they are moving with velocity very close to the speed of light. So they are, and they are spinning, so they have a large acceleration. In terms of geometry, this means the curvature invariants are becoming very large. But this field theory really doesn't work near the part. So the way out, of course, and what we are doing is writing an EFT for the part, essentially. Writing EFT for the parts attached, attached to spin. And the basic idea is that within a petty field theory, these quarks are not anymore fundamental particles, or more precisely, we cannot resolve them microscopic, you can only resolve them as some blobs whose size is the only scale of the theory it's a less. Because it can't use this scale. And uh, if you look at this picture and then you do some relativistic kinematics, so the way to do effective theory, so let me say that, is then before to cut off your string at these points here and impose boundary condition. The, the non trivial thing is that there is some redshift factor to take into account when you do that. Because Particles that are spinning have a word line, have a metric, as everybody knows, as all of you know, which is in a proper time, which is different than observing at rest here. So this means that the proper time for the quarks, if you do the kinematic carefully accounting for this size, is 
the proper time for an observer at rest divided j to the one quarter. So, so I think in this case, j to the one quarter, this is what. Let me just write it like this j to the one quarter. So this means that, so if you have a twist and you propagate a wave from here to here, this wave will appear blue shifted for part of an observer sitting on top of the bar. So this means that your effective cutoff would be lambda y mills so one over left divided j to the one quarter. So the effective filter expansion will be uh, less effective than you would have thought. This is not yet a problem because the typical energy of an excitation is one over l, which is one over square root of j. So it's still below this, but this one. So anyhow, so once you take all this into account, it's okay, we are now writing this effective field theory carefully. And what you find is that you can compute subleading corrections up to a relatively low order in J in terms of two Wilson coefficients, C1 and C2 here. This will some coefficient somehow renormalize of the divergences that you were seeing before. And this C1 and C2 also allow you to compute the energies of the divergent trajectory. So what we're doing now is essentially using this systematized effective field theory, trying to compare with data, and hopefully soon generalize these to blue balls. But uh, I think the main point of this formula, besides the weird powers of J's that arise because of these factors, is that also this linear region relation that I'm presenting should be understood in a static field theory sense. It's really a relative of the calculation of the hydrogen atoms' energy at large and their momentum. And pretty much like in that case, there are corrections that you can compute systematically up to the price of some recent coefficients. So this is going to be all. Thank you. We have time for questions. Gabriel, I would have thought of the C2 theta term that could be j to the minus one half. If I have to compare to the formula for the large charge. No, if because you so go from the j, you go from the if first. If you accept this to be the leading term, is all. The, this is the one that is square in terms of this. Mm. So you should not consider the, <laughs> the first one as the leading term. Yeah, so if you want, this is a, a new term. Yeah, so you should consider this as the leading boundary term. Okay. And then this function. Oh, because this is a boundary term. Yes, yeah. this is the boundary term. Okay. And, and don't you have a distribution from the bulk? Uh, it's farther down because the, there are some operator redundancies, so the first one vanishes. So if you want, this is this order zero is a quantum correction. <coughs> yeah, bulk. this is the casting. Right? Yeah, and then there is a one over j squared. Okay. <coughs> so have you assumed that, that the quarks are heavy or light? Like so, sorry, I should have said this is massless quarks or light quarks. So lighter compared to the case of escape. So up and down. And the quarks. string doesn't break because they're very large and Because I'm assuming, yeah. So in the real world, yeah, it's an approximation that the string doesn't break. The reason why we thought this approximation was good is because of this picture. This picture really follows from a string which doesn't break. But uh, it doesn't turn, turns, as it turns out, it's not so good now that you're looking at data. So really our main goal now is going to blue balls where we can do that simulation and extrapolate to large n that should work well. The blue balls are for the string. Yeah, they are for the string. So uh, what kind of boundary uh, EFT terms do you have do you have for the C1 to the C2 to the Well, uh, <laughs> I can tell you more later, I guess, but this is roughly a master. This is roughly... Uh, so the point is that since they're spinning fast, the leading term is really acceleration. So like x double dot square with some proper power. And this is like x triple dot square, in a sense. So we can show you later the problem. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a fermionic boundary versus a photonic boundary? Not really. Not really. Actually, one of the things we study is to study the spin states. So like to add spin on the boundaries. So one surprising fact we found was is that uh, the fact that the boundary is a spin with an effective field here doesn't change much. This is because the quarks are spinning very fast mm -hmm. and spin when the spinning particle undergoes Thomas precession. Thomas precession quantum mechanics means that there is a gap between spin up and spin down state. Turns out that the gap of these states for large acceleration is at the cutoff. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't change much. Could you like make a plot of that analogous to a rigid trajectory for some well, I mean, sort of realistic parameters? Uh, well, I mean, 
So these corrections are small. I just would be that uh, I sorry, two to the one quarter. Let's see. Let's see. So two to the one quarter. This means that this is starting. Uh, well, I can imagine with arbitrary coefficients, but I just meant realistically. What does it do? To I mean, so that the problem is that. Um, I mean, it's it just going to bend closer to the beginning, but for realistic arbitrary coefficient, the point is that we are not so sure that this is working so well at this stage here, I think. So for the linear trajectory, it seems to work, but then we looked at the bi and the other states on top of the linear trajectory. And this like is, the first word, the what trajectory? So here, you have the rho and a are the smallest, the lowest energy masses with as a spin one, but fixed j. So let's look at the one with higher. So you're gonna have states here. You're gonna have states here. So the effective field theory, for instance, for this that stays like here, somewhere like at a certain gap, which is determined by this law. You find states here, exactly in between, for instance. So there is some mystery in the fact that the leading energy trajectory is so straight, which is why people thought it was string theory, and the fact that the, dump, the states here are not really matching the extrapolation of the FT. Of course, it's j for four five, so maybe it's our inability from a particular theory. But there is also, I think we have puzzles. I was trying to, I, I just am not putting it together well. What the, what the data looks like roughly, and what your curve looks like. So I think yeah. the one our our curve, I mean, for the linear trajectory, just a, rather than being exactly straight, is going to be a bit tilted here. So it curves up, you say, yeah. and you know. Your parameters tell you. I think Gladys wants to know whether it bends like this or like this. So I, I think it's it 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 I, I'd so love to see some values of linear, linear momentum. Here it's on linear, it. and then it's gonna tilt a bit like down here, right? But, but, I mean, if you put some numbers no? on, we could tell is it I, 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 a, a major difference? Is it microscopic? Is it? I don't know. Honestly, we so, okay. That's what something should have done here, right? I I think. No, I mean, we have to. These are numbers you have to fit. I don't. I think it's gonna be very microscopic, honestly. Because of the fact that experimentally it's very linear. Yeah. So I mean, so this C ones here. So this, you would have guessed this to be of order one over ls, which is so one over ls square. I think it's roughly zero point eight GB square, right? Something like that. So I think this C one here you would have expected to be order one in units of this field. Instead, I think if you fit it, it's probably more like zero point four. Something like this, I think it shows up a bit that. So I don't think, uh, I mean, again, so you're I, saying it's a factor of two smaller than the but, it, but the problem with this feed is <coughs> you have five data. So if you input this, so what people typically, if you input the j to the zero term, then this becomes large. If you don't input it, it changes. So we don't have a reliable estimate of this of this term at this stage because it's really, you know, it's five points and you can add you know, up to two, three, four coefficients. So this fluctuates a lot. So if you're asking the exact value, it's going to be roughly half of this in all the reasonable fit, but the precise value depends really on how you fit and data that we don't have. You have a, a, I mean, your picture with the sphere with a radius of 100 was very impressive, but would you, would you have like a really different picture of the quark distributions and one would have naively thought that they were just Gaussians or something? Um, Do you see any sign of like, like a centrifugal barrier that's sticking the one on the outside or anything? Centrifugal. Um, so you're saying if I can plot a wave function for no, this guy? I'm just curious if you looked at it, if it was. Uh, we, so you did in the, sorry, what, what? I think in, so you're saying like you want to have it like in the quark potential, quark model, the wave function for this quark. Well, that's what you were sort of doing, right? You had a, at least you started yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. But in principle, right, you could imagine making E plus E minus and making pairs of these things. And you could see if you had a prediction. Maybe it fits so badly for the masses that you just. You're don't saying you could predict the way the distribution of the wave. But I mean, I, yeah, that's a very good point. I, I think, think we could. Really. So for light bars, I'm a bit skeptical because, uh, as I said, for light bars, the way we understand these endpoints is more like not really the quark, it's some effective endpoint. But we could do this for every bars, for like a CC bar. Like, of course, you need larger J there because you need more inertia to make them spin. Then we could. Uh, Look at the prediction for our wave function. But then at the ring order, this prediction it's essentially a, potent, a potential, a theory of a linear potential for two quark right. So, which is so what people already saw. Sorry. So, yeah. Gabriel, can, can you phrase what Glenn was asking, which is actually interesting, in terms of 
operator correlators, like you can compute semi classically in the other case of correlators. Uh, it's some overlap by, by some current, it plus and minus into a hadronic current, and then you compute some overlaps. It's yeah. a big one. It's, it's a big one. No, no, I think, I think there are good points. So we can match uh, the final steps. So maybe we should have to work off. But so I, mean, I, 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 so I think, so the problem is that the, we don't have a, a current uh, for I. So yeah. we, there is not a stranger scatter you know, okay. on this thing, which is what you're asking. Uh, I suspend current. For the heavy quartz, we could do it because we could control that. Okay, so we should do that. Together. Yeah, in view of time, let's uh, thank everybody. <laughs> Do you have a sign of this